Joining us on Zoom right now is going to be Michael Middlebrooks. He is a professor, an associate professor of biology at the University of Tampa, and we're going to talk about seagrasses. Michael was recently awarded a grant by the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund to study how seagrasses in Tampa Bay are being replaced by macroalgae called Colerpa. So welcome to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Professor Middlebrooks. Thank you, Sean. I'm really gl glad to talk to you. So um, what can you, before we talk about your grant and your research, let's back things up just a bit. What kind of ecosystem is Tampa Bay and what's the role of seagrasses in Tampa Bay? Sure, so uh, Tampa Bay is an, an estuary, um, which is an ecosystem that is uh, basically where the um, marine systems and freshwater systems uh, join together, where, where, they, where they meet. So we've got the uh, outflow from primarily the Hillsborough River, but, but some other as well, freshwater inputs coming in uh, and mixing with the, uh, with the ocean. And that, that's uh, the Gulf of Mexico, and that's happening within Tampa Bay. So we have a sort of a brackish water system. Um, so the salinity will vary depending on how much rain we have, how much freshwater input there is. Um, and then the, so, so you get a sort of a, a salinity gradient going from, from very up, upper parts out to full strength seawater at the uh, at the end of it in the opening. So, and and that changing environmental condition uh, affects what what organisms live there. Seagrass has a really important role in this for for a lot of reasons. So, from um, you know from a, a a human standpoint, it's it's a very valuable ecosystem for us to have in terms of shoreline protection. Um, so so ha having seagrass means that it it reduces you know what wave energy, so it, it allows the coast to stay intact uh, better. Uh, it's also really important habitat for lots of organisms. So, uh, and a lot of those are commercially important fish or nursery grounds for commercially important uh, fisheries, thing, things like that. It's also really important for us in terms of its role in uh, carbon sequestration. So in, you may have heard of blue carbon, which is how the ocean can can store carbon, um, keeping it out of, out of the atmosphere. And one of the ways that can do that that's uh, healthy for the ocean is in, in seagrass. So it can actually store a lot of carbon there. From an ecological standpoint, it's also really important for, uh, for a lot of reasons, Pri primarily as a habitat. So there are a lot of organisms that live in the seagrass. Um, one, one thing that people don't expect is that seagrass is not eaten by most of the organisms that live in there. There are a few things that eat it and it's very important for them, but most of the animals that live there use it as, as, a, as a home. So it's really the structure that it's providing that's really important for, for those organisms. Our guest is Michael Middlebrooks, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Tampa. And we're talking about seagrasses. And later on in the interview, we'll talk about a grant that he was awarded by the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund to study how seagrasses in Tampa Bay are being replaced by a macroalgae called Colerpa. And Michael, you were just talking there about animals that live in the seagrasses and are protected by the habitat of the seagrasses. That includes some juvenile fish as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's a a lot of uh, a lot of organisms will use that as a, as a nursery habitat. Um, others live there their their entire lives. So it depends on you know different species. But there there's a, a a very robust ecosystem happening in in seagrass beds. Um, they there, there's a lot of things that really can't live anywhere else. And and for a lot of organisms, that's a really crucial life stage occurs in. Um, and that, and that includes a lot of juvenile fish, and including some commercially important ones. And so a few years ago, we had reports, we heard that the seagrasses in Tampa Bay were bouncing back, that they had declined maybe in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, or sometime in that time frame. But then in the around 2010s, they were bouncing back a little bit. Is that changing? How are seagrasses doing in Tampa Bay? Yeah, so... Um, T Tampa Bay uh, was, and, and to some extent still is, a, a really big success story in the world of seagrass. Worldwide, seagrass is declining al almost everywhere and, and, and at tremendous levels. Um, it's something around, I think the, the most recent estimate I read worldwide was about 7% per year are 
dropping off. So it's it's rates similar to the declines we're seeing in coral reefs and um, uh, rainforests, uh, pl places like that, that that get a lot of attention. Um, but we're, we're seeing similar rates of, of decline. Um, Tampa Bay had some pretty significant declines as well. From the 1950s, we estimates are about uh, 40,000 acres, I think. And then, um, you know, it in the um, by the early 80s, it had declined to to uh, a, a, a lot less than that. Um, and there's a lot of factors involved in that. But um, the success in Tampa Bay came from uh, a lot of people working together, uh, you know, uh, nonprofit organizations, the local governments and, and citizens working to improve uh, the, the basically the water quality in Tampa Bay. And that primarily came about, I mean, there, there was a lot of efforts that went into that. So there was seagrass restoration, but the biggest improvement in, in my opinion, came from managing water quality. So wastewater treatment uh, and things like that. And by improving the water quality, it, it allowed the seagrass to return. And that that's made a huge difference. By 2014, 2015, seagrass had surpassed the historic le levels in the 1950s that, that had been recorded. So it had not only grown back to previous levels, but was, was further increasing. And that, that's really good news in a time when that wasn't happening anywhere else. So there, there's a lot of success in Tampa. In the past couple of years, we've we've seen declines again in seagrass. We are still above the, the very low levels. And we um, I, I still think that we are a good model for what can be done to improve seagrass quality. Um, but we, we are starting to see declines in that. Um, and so that, yeah, that, that is concerning. We don't, we certainly don't want to get back to those levels, uh, the, in the seventies and eighties where there was, um, very low seagrass cover, uh, high amounts of, of, uh, other algae growing in the, uh, in Tampa Bay and, and very low water quality. Our guest is Michael Middlebrooks, an associate professor of biology at the University of Tampa. And you're listening to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. It's 1020, it's 1029 in the morning, I should say. And we're talking about seagrasses and the health of seagrasses in Tampa Bay. So you mentioned water quality and what an important component that is of, of healthy seagrasses. I, I might throw you a curve here and ask you what's become a political question in the city of Tampa, and that is what to do with the millions and millions of gallons of treated seawater, sorry, treated um, wastewater that is that goes into Tampa Bay right now. Uh, the city wants to do something that opponents have called toilet to tap. The city calls it pure. That's, you know, maybe pumping it back into the aquifer is one of the options. Or what should we, what should happen with all of that treated wastewater that it goes into Tampa Bay? I mean, it, the bay needs fresh water, but it probably doesn't need all the pollutants that are in, in that water. Yeah, and that that is a difficult question, and I, I'm probably not the most qualified person to answer that one, but I, I'll, I'll do my best for that. Um, my, uh, w when you say the, the pollutants going in there, I, uh, the, the, the real concern from, from my perspective and, and for if we're focusing on seagrass is the nutrients that are, that are in the, that water. So it's primarily an, uh, um, you know, adding in the extra, basically the same stuff that you would, you would add to fertilize plants, right? We, and, while seagrass is a plant and and needs nutrients, it doesn't having that many nutrients in the water uh, causes its competitors, little microalgae in the water, to to really grow faster. So they're you know you can sort of think of them like weeds. They grow very quickly when that happens. And these these are um, primarily the ones we're concerned about are are little planktonic organisms. But there there are some that do grow directly on the seagrass as well. When they grow too quickly it blocks the light from getting to the seagrass and the seagrass doesn't grow. So whatever solution we come up with, we um, reducing the amount of nutrients that goes into Tampa Bay needs to be part of that. Um, otherwise we're going to lose the seagrass and um, we're, we're gonna have very low water quality in the Bay. And that's going to mean, uh, you know, reduced uh, ability for people to fish recreationally, uh, or reduce desire to to spend time, you know, in, in any recreational capacity on the bay. It's going to reduce tourism. It's going to um, 
produce the quality of, of life for anybody who lives near the, uh, near the water. Um, and it's, it uh, has a lot of other compounding effects. So any solution that they come up with really does need to involve reducing the, that nutrient input. You've mentioned how seagrasses had really bounced back in Tampa Bay, but how are they doing in other parts of the state? We hear all the time about the Indian River Lagoon and the seagrass die off there. That's led to uh, a lot of problems there on the east coast of Florida. How about Florida Bay uh, down, down south of the Everglades? How about seagrasses you know, near the Florida Keys? Where else are seagrasses doing well and where else are they struggling and why? So, hmm. I don't know about specific other locations in, in Florida. My, my uh, area of research really is T Tampa Bay for, for this uh, in, in terms of seagrass, but on average worldwide seagrass is declining and, and, and the East coast of Florida is an area that's been hit pretty badly uh, recently. Uh, th there are still places with seagrass. I, I don't think it's too late anywhere to take action, um, but some places it will be harder than others when there's no seagrass left it can be very difficult to to reestablish. Um, seagrass is a is a plant, um, and uh, I, I should also say that there are m multiple species of seagrass, and they are um, while they are functionally quite similar in in what they do in an ecosystem, the way they grow is not all the same. So some of them um, can be restored to an area through seeds, um, but most of them require. To, uh, they're, they're you know they grow like a, a, a grass they're not not a true grass but they grow in a similar manner so they, they grow out from the from the main plant so if you don't have an established colony there it's very difficult to to re-establish that so um you know efforts on protecting what's left are really important to 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 regrow it there 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 is some success in some instances of replanting seagrass beds and that that has been successful in a number of areas that only works if the conditions are are also improved though right you can't put seagrass into an area where there's not enough light hitting it because there's so much uh, microalgae in the water that won't, it won't be successful no matter how healthy the plant you put in was. And it and need, needs good conditions. So, it, um, well, but it, it more at your question, you know, worldwide we're, we're seeing big declines and, and there are a handful of areas that have shown some local success but it, it takes a, a lot of effort to maintain that, um, to, to really keep the water quality up and, um, and, and keep, um, you know, keep that in check as, as populations grow, right? You know, a water management system that does well uh, a decade ago may not work today. Our guest is Michael Middlebrooks, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Tampa. He was recently awarded a grant by the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund to study how seagrasses in Tampa Bay are being replaced by macroalgae called Calerpa. So let's talk now on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe about that study. It will involve UT students as well as yourself. What, were you, what will you be doing during this study? Sure, so we've got a couple components to the study. The, the first one, um, uh, a little more background on this. So as some of the seagrass in Tampa Bay has declined, uh, in some of those areas, we are seeing it be replaced by uh, a, a macroalgae called calerpa. So if uh, to the untrained eye, calerpa looks like a seagrass. Um, it it uh, is sort of similarly shaped and it, and it can grow in sort of a similar pattern. There, there are multiple species of calerpa as well. The one that we're looking at here um, grows in, in a similar fashion to seagrass and it grows along the, the ocean floor. Um, so, it, and it has sort of these um, uh, leaf-like bl uh, blades on it. They're not true leaves. Um, it's, it's, it's actually an algae, not a, not a true plant, um, but it's growing in some of these areas. And the first part of our study is to look at how um, Calerpa serves as a habitat for all those organisms that we were talking about uh, previously. So all of the the animals, particularly, we're, we're really interested in, in this case in some of the very uh, small animals that are living in this this habitat. So some of the the um, ones maybe a little bit lower down the food chain that um, that use that as a primary habitat for their whole lives. So we're we're looking at the invertebrate animals and going to compare them uh, between the 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 Calerpa habitat and the the um, 
uh, one of our species of seagrass uh, to see if they're providing a similar um, ecosystem for, for these organisms. Um, and this is impo important, can tell us a lot about what uh, is happening further on. If we, if we have a very similar community uh, of, of organisms growing in these systems, then that can tell us that this calerpa can be a sort of a functionally equivalent. If they're very different, however, this could mean that you know we're, we're seeing a, a big change in, in the ecosystems. Um, that calerpa being there is not necessarily bad. It might, in fact, be good in the in the short term for us because it will help stabilize some of the sediment. It might provide a, a habitat for a lot of these organisms. Um, but we we don't know this uh, how equivalent this is in, until we measure it. Do the calerpa and seagrasses actually compete for resources or compete for space? So there, there is some competition for space. Um, typically, what will happen though is um, in a in a very healthy system, um, you will see one of one of two things. Uh, the calerpa will go into an area first, and eventually the seagrass will outcompete it. The seagrass is a, a stronger competitor. Um, you can sort of think of it like comparing weeds to a to a forest, right? The seagrass, once it's established, is is better at holding its ground there. Um, the other thing that you can see in some healthy systems is a, a sort of a mixed habitat where you'll get a little bit of calerpa mixed in with with some of the seagrass, but it's not not dominant now. Right now, in some of these areas that used to be primarily seagrass, we have a, a very high coverage of. Calerpa. Um, and I did some scouting the other day. And we, we basically had no um, seagrass in some of these areas that had 100% cover of the Calerpa. So there's a, there's a lot of it in there. Um, but I, it, it could be easier if seagrass recovers for it to, to move into those areas occupied by Calerpa. I want to ask you right now about water flow in Tampa Bay. Uh, before construction began on the new span of the Howard Franklin's Bridge, I was at a St. Peter's St. Pete City Council workshop, and there was a professor from Eckerd College there that told St. Pete City Council that he was recommending that there be breaks constructed in the existing causeway of the Howard Franklin Bridge, and uh, possibly in the Courtney Campbell as well, if, if my memory is a little fuzzy. But so the purpose of constructing these breaks would be so that there could be better water flow into and out of Upper Tampa Bay. Those breaks never happened. That wasn't part of the construction, but in maybe even worse news, perhaps, is that acres and acres of the floor of Tampa Bay have now been filled in to create additional causeway that's adjacent to that new span of the Howard Franklin. So what can you tell us about um, water flow and how that what that has to do with healthy seagrasses? And I don't know if that links at all to the study that you're doing. So we don't have a direct link to this, but it, it certainly can have an impact on, on that. We, we've been talking so far about the, the trouble with nutrients, and this can compound some of those troubles. If you don't have, uh, in an estuary, if you don't have regular flushing of, of that, right, the nutrients that are coming from the land, right, from the rivers uh, and, and from rainfall, if that builds up, and, and any other inputs that we have, if that builds up in Tampa Bay and does not disperse further, you're going to have a, a big increase in those nutrients. Um, you can also have a big increase in silt um, from, from heavy rainfalls and things like that. Again, doesn't get the opportunity to flush out into the Gulf of Mexico. All of those things are reducing the, um, the water quality and they're reducing uh, how much light penetrates through the, um, through the water to, to get to the seagrass. So those issues can, can cause a big deal. Construction, uh, of course, mar marine construction is also going to cause some, some silting as well. So you know, I think it would be expected to see some of that occurring uh, dur during periods of construction. Um, by making breaks, uh, you could improve the hydrodynamic flow uh, and manage that. Um, the, I don't know the specific hydrodynamics behind that, um, but you know, that, that is something that probably should be considered um, to, to improve our water quality in, in the Bay is, is keeping those flows, flows happening. Our guest is Michael Middlebrooks, an associate professor of biology at the University of Tampa. And we're talking about his research on seagrasses in Tampa Bay and their competition from the algae calerpa. 
Well, we have a, a caller in, uh, who's on the line. I'm going to try to get to in just a second. Oh, caller dropped off, might be calling back in. But in the meantime, let me ask you, Mike, what what is the Tampa Bay Environmental Restoration Fund? That's where you got this grant to study, to do this study. So tell us what that group is. Sure. So uh, the Tampa Bay uh, um, Environmental Restoration Fund is a, uh, it's a competitive grant um, that is uh, administered by the um, uh Bay Estuary Program. Uh, so the, the funding comes from private donors and, and public the public sector. And so these are uh, projects that cover a wide variety of different uh, aspects. So they can be uh, things like uh, science, uh, data gathering like we're doing now. They can be restoration projects. They can be um, uh, community education projects. So, so th these grants are awarded to a, a lot of different groups and, and individuals to do things to help improve the um, the the quality of our of our estuary um, in, in, through a variety of different uh, mechanisms. Um, it's a it's a very good program. Um, it's it's uh, organized and managed very well. And one of the things that I'm uh, quite pleased about working with them is they they operate under a, a system of open science. So all of the data that we're collecting, all the information that we learn from that, is going to be publicly available. When will your research be complete and analyzed, and when will we kind of have an idea of what you find out about Calerpa and seagrasses and how they're competing for uh, resources in the Tampa Bay? So uh, this this is a three year project, so it's going to take us uh, quite a while to get to get all of the data. But part of the open science principles are that as we collect data, it will be uh, it will be available. So, um, but the the final project will be done in about three years. Um, and uh, hopefully at, at that time, we'll be um, right, you know, writing a scientific manuscript about it and, and formalizing all of our results. But um, as as we learn things and as we complete different phases of this project, that, that data will start to become available. And if people want to find out about more about you or about your lab or about your research or this project specifically, where can they go to find out? So if you want to learn more about uh, things going on with, with seagrass projects in particular, I'd say the Tampa Bay Estuary Programs website is a, is a good place to start for that. Um, my, uh, my other uh, sort of research outreach stuff is, is actually focused on the other aspects of, of my research. So I don't have a lot on this currently, but uh, it'll start to... to go on there some as, as we do more. Um, but I have a, an Instagram page about my research lab called uh, U Tampa Slug Life. I primarily research uh, sea slugs uh, is what, what I've done for a lot of my projects. And I still have uh, sea, uh, sea slug projects going on. Um, so that is uh, my, my Instagram page is probably the, the best place to see um, fun science related things related to my lab. So there'll start to be some seagrass stuff on there soon as we start getting pictures out in the field and, and doing some of that, maybe, maybe as soon as this week. Uh, right now it's mostly things about, about my sea slug research. And we have a question that, that's coming in from Sid in Tampa who wants to ask about Calerpa and seagrass in Tampa Bay. Hi, hi Sid. Yeah, hi, let me first preface my question that Overall, the seagrass has increased in Tampa Bay since the 70s, the 80s, due to much better nitrogen management. But apparently, I've heard in the last couple of years, there's been some decline in seagrass coverage in parts of Tampa Bay. My question for the professor is, Is does nutrient enrichment favor or not favor Calerpa uh, versus seagrass? Or does Calerpa grow well in nutrient-poor environments? Or does eutrophication or nutrient enrichment favor Calerpa over seagrass? Thanks for the question. That's an excellent question. Um, I think that Calerpa grows faster in high nutrients than seagrass does. Um, so it probably, this probably gives them uh, the Calerpa a bit of an advantage here with that, that increase in nutrients. Um, a high enough increase in nutrients would probably also be detrimental to the Calerpa because uh, the, the microalgaes will uh, outcompete that eventually, or they'll, they'll block out the light from getting to it as well. It's still a marine plant and needs um, needs light, but calerpa uh, species in general are fairly good at 
uh, extracting nutrients from 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 the water. Uh, a lot of them do live in fairly nutrient poor conditions, though. So I think they're they're fairly versatile in what they can survive in, but they do grow quite quickly when nutrients are available. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for the question. Sure. Bye. Thanks for the question, Sid. And uh, we have another person who writes in and asks about, you were mentioning the microalgae outcompeting when there's high nutrients. Does that apply to red tide? Is the, the red tide microorganism outcompeting seagrasses in high nutrients? To, is, what happens, I guess, maybe to seagrasses during a red tide? So yeah, red, red tide is also a, um, well, that's a, another complicated uh, phenomenon. Um, but yes, uh, high amounts of red tide can, can, can cause, uh, light to not penetrate deep enough for the seagrass. Uh, in addition to the other problems that red tide blooms can, can have, I mean, they, they are toxic to a lot of marine life. And so they're, they're causing a, a myriad of issues. Um, nutrient input does have an impact on red tide, but it's, um, it is more complicated than just that. There, there's a lot of other environmental factors there as well. Um, so, but yeah, new, there, there are some nutrient limitations that that uh, can stop a red tide bloom from occurring. Um, that, you know, the organism that causes that is naturally part of our environment. Um, so some of it there is not a bad thing. It's when, the, when there's, there's too much. And that uh, an increase in nutrients can be one of the things that contributes to that. It's not the only thing. There, there's, this is a, very complicated ecosystem, but that, that is one to be concerned about. Yeah. That's a good question as well. Yeah. Thanks for those questions. And I want to thank you so much for coming on WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Professor Middlebrooks. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Michael Middlebrooks is Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Tampa. And you can watch this full interview beginning this afternoon. It'll be on our website, wmnf.org.